Good morning, everyone. On this Sunday morning, we give thanks to God that we can be together to worship our sovereign Lord and Savior. We warmly welcome all guests joining us this morning. Council has the following announcement. With joy, consistory can accede to the request by Lydia Duker, Matthew Kolkman, Sarah Koning, Haley Leffers, Esther Stell, Kyle Stixma, Mariah Tolsma, Lucas Van Dyke, Brooke Van Veldeheisen, Joshua Vandenberg, Jordan Vanderlinde, and Connor Zeldernist to publicly profess their faith. If there are no lawful objections to the, their profession of faith, it is scheduled for May 1st, 2022 in the morning worship service. This morning's worship service will be led by our pastor, Reverend Julius Vince Bronson. In our preparation for worship, we will praise our God with the singing of hymn 31. Let us rise for worship and lift up our hearts to the Lord. We begin this worship service by together confessing our dependence on the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We'll now sing together hymn 32. Another Resurrection Easter hymn.
The Lord redeemed us. He gave us new life. He teaches us how to live in our redeemed life. The ten words of the covenant. As we reflect on these ten commandments, we also compare them uh, to our own lives. And as we do that, we recognize in ourselves our sins and our need for the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ and the payment he made on the cross. And he works in our hearts a desire to then live uh, in keeping in step with his spirit. And God speaks all these words saying, it's Exodus chapter 20. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Our Lord Jesus summarized this commandment, Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now we respond to this law praising its value in our lives with the singing of Psalm 112, stanza 1. Let us join together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for life. We thank you that you have revealed yourself to us so that we might walk with you in fellowship. We thank you for creating us with love in our hearts, love for you, 
love for our neighbor. We thank you, Father, that even after the fall into sin, you have restored us to love, to life. We thank you for guiding us in our redeemed life with these Ten Commandments that we could read, the Ten Words of the Covenant. That you have so clearly shown to us how we may show ourselves thankful to you. As we consider the goodness of your law, the goodness of these Ten Commandments, the blessing they bring to those who obey your words, we also can see, O oh Lord, how many times each one of us has broken your laws, sinned against you, causing harm to our neighbor, showing a lack of love toward you. And Father, we are humbled when we stand in the presence, in your presence, with your law shining down upon us. We confess before you our sins. We confess that we are not deserving of the grace that you show to us. That's why we are so overwhelmed with thanksgiving and joy to know the gospel, to know that Jesus Christ took the punishment that we deserved upon his own shoulders and that he was truly righteous and that you declared his righteousness to the world by raising him from the dead, that in Jesus' resurrection we could see the hope of new life, restoration to fellowship with you. We thank you that we may celebrate as your people on this Easter Sunday, rejoicing in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, not only over the grave, but over the evil one, over sin. We thank you that in him we may live in the hope of the resurrection from the dead, everlasting life. We ask, Father, that as we turn to your word again this morning, that you will bless the reading of your word and its proclamation. That you will equip your servant in this place as he proclaims that gospel, that he may do so faithfully to your glory. We ask that as we together hear your word and respond with songs of praise, that you will lift up our hearts to you, that we may truly worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we will read together from Matthew. On Good Friday we read of the Lord Jesus' crucifixion and his death as that's explained to us in Matthew chapter 27. We'll begin... Uh, our reading today at Matthew 27, verse 57. That's on page 835 in the Pew Bible. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir... We remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead 
and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. As far as the reading of Scripture, we'll now sing together Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a psalm that speaks of the conspiring of the nations against the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and how, in spite of their conspiring, he rules as eternal king. We'll sing Psalm 2, all the stanzas.
text for the message this morning is Matthew 27, verses 62 to 66, and Matthew 28, verses 11 to 15, focusing on the spiritual battle, also as the devil was hard at work even on Easter around the tomb. And we read that again the next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And after the resurrection, we read in Matthew 28, verse 11, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, They gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, Tell people, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Beloved Church of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Easter is a day of victory and triumph that is focused on the new tomb where Joseph of Arimathea had placed the dead body of a man named Jesus who had been crucified. The tomb had terraces carved in the limestone so that several bodies could be placed inside over time and a little chamber at the front entrance that could be blocked by a large stone that was rolled to the entrance. And although we often imagine Jesus' tomb to be a place of quiet solitude, with people coming perhaps to place flowers and say a silent prayer, the Apostle Matthew tells us that in reality, Jesus became the focus of a great spiritual battle, the focus of an elaborate scheme to prove that Jesus was a liar and the focus of an ancient lie that was concocted to undermine the truthful preaching of the gospel of Easter. The good news is that the attempts of Jesus' enemies failed miserably. And I preach you the gospel under this theme that the gospel of Christ's empty tomb is a truth that cannot be suppressed. We'll see the impact, the rejection, and the victory of this truth. Our text begins in Matthew 27, verse 62, by stating that the next day, that is the day after, or the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together on the steps outside Pilate's palace. Now, preparation day is the Friday before the Sabbath on which the Jews would prepare meals and do tasks that could not be done on the Sabbath day of rest. Preparation day is what we call Good Friday today. So the events described in our text begin on Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath day, which was the day after the crucified body had been in the tomb one night. And when our text indicates that the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together, it highlights the differences between these two groups that were meeting. The chief priests, who are probably, for the most part, Sadducees, were men of very high rank among the Jewish people. They were power-hungry members of the Sanhedrin who were concerned about maintaining the status quo more than anything else. The Pharisees are different from the chief priests in that they were more religious and more concerned with the law. They are the ones who were involved in the theological discussions with Jesus throughout his life. Throw Pilate, the Roman governor, into the fray, and we see Psalm 2 that we sang taking place right in our text. 
The kings and rulers of the earth engage. They stand prepared. They all conspire together against the Lord and His anointed King. Rather than worship the Creator on this blessed and hallowed Sabbath day of rest, the restless Pharisees and chief priests madly rage together before the foreign governor, plotting together even after Jesus had been killed and was lying in a tomb. What more could these men possibly want to do to him? The problem for the Jewish leaders was that they had a better memory than the disciples who had scurried away to different places after the crucifixion. And the Pharisees are, are more aware of the implications if Jesus' words came true. By calling Jesus an imposter or a deceiver, they made it sound like he was a false messiah. And they warned Pilate that it wouldn't take much for Jesus' disciples to deceive even more people and cause even more upheaval. They had heard Jesus validating his authority by providing a sign. We read that conversation in Matthew 12, verse 40, where Jesus said, Just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Can you imagine what it would mean for the chief priests and the Pharisees if the grave spat Jesus out after three days like the fish spit Jonah out? It would not only prove that he was not an imposter, but it would prove that one greater than Jonah had come with divine authority. They would need to bow before Jesus, the Son of Man, in humble repentance. This makes us realize what we are confessing every time we state or sing the Apostles' Creed, that on the third day He rose from the dead. When we say that, we are declaring that Jesus is truly the Christ, the promised Messiah, that he was truly righteous in God's eyes and that his death is able to save you from the wrath of God that our sins deserve. When you confess Christ's resurrection, you are declaring that Christ's death was a part of God's saving plan, that he truly conquered sin and Satan in the grave and that if you submit to him, you too will be raised up to new life. Belief in the resurrection is life-changing. Paul shows how Christ's resurrection gives meaning to all of our lives when he writes in 1 Corinthians 15, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But if we believe in the fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it causes irreversible change to our entire worldview. For our hope is not only in this life, but also in the resurrection from the dead. We may live knowing that our Lord and Savior has power over death, the last enemy. We may live each day with the hope of our own glorious resurrection. When we are given faith to believe in Jesus Christ, we move from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from from death to life. In His grace and compassion towards us, the Lord took many steps to ensure that we never need to doubt whether or not Jesus Christ rose from the dead. He started by employing Jesus' enemies to guard the tomb. We could see why the chief priests and Pharisees asked Pilate to place a guard at the tomb. 
They had not been convinced that Jesus was the Messiah by his entire preaching and miracle ministry, which they referred to as the first fraud. And they certainly did not want to face further opposition to their Jewish religion by a bunch of lowly disciples who tricked the world by stealing a body in order to keep that Jesus movement going. Well, so what did they do? We read it in our text. The most powerful people in the land devised a security plan that involved several well-trained Roman soldiers who were commanded to keep everyone away from the tomb. And that tomb had also been sealed so that it would be impossible for anyone to open the tomb, take the body, and close it again without giving away the secret. The guard would prevent anyone from coming. And with the seal on the stone, the Jewish leaders could be sure that the disciples couldn't bribe the guards to let let them at the body. And so until early Sunday morning, The Lord Jesus was lying in a tamper-proof tomb secured with soldiers. The Jewish leaders had done everything they could. Verse 65. They had done everything they could to ensure that the tomb would not be empty after three days. The tension was in the air. Would the body still be there? After three days. The account of the conspiring of the Jewish leaders is continued in Matthew 28, verses 11 to 15. It was Sunday morning, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The city was probably full of Jews from all over celebrating this feast. Matthew allows us to picture the scene very clearly. Peaceful Sunday morning as the chief priests are sitting together in rush several Roman soldiers. They're white with fear. These soldiers, explain Matthew, were part of the guard that was watching Jesus' tomb. And they told the chief priests everything that had happened. It would have been a message like the one Matthew wrote down in chapter 28, verses 2-4. to four. You can hear the soldiers saying everything. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And because we were so afraid of him, we, we trembled and we became like dead men. Jesus, who had been lying dead in the grave, was raised to life, and his enemies became like dead men. Their report was probably similar to the explanation of the angel. He he was not there. He had risen, just as he said. The angel had rolled back the large stone so that the guards themselves could witness the empty tomb. But now the exact words that the Jewish leaders tried to prevent the disciples from proclaiming were coming out of their fellow schemers. It's what Psalm 2 refers to when it speaks of rash attempts and empty striving. Christ had conquered the grave And the Lord used the Roman guards to proclaim the glorious news. Well, sadly, the Jewish leaders do not rejoice or repent when they hear the glorious news of the empty tomb. But instead, they immediately devise another plan. They see the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ like a bump on the road that they are driving on to their own end. Although they fully understood the impact of the resurrection, in fact, they were frightened of the impact. Although they fully realized that Christ's empty tomb would be the certain testimony that He indeed was the the righteous One received by God, When they are faced with the direct reality of it, the Jewish leaders 
They turn their hearts away from Jesus Christ. They outright denied Christ's victory over death. They behaved worse than the people of Nineveh when Jonah came to them, for they did not repent. We are reminded of the words of Abraham to the rich man in Jesus' parable about the rich man and Lazarus, where the Lord Jesus portrays the depth of rejection. He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Well, the Jewish leaders sealed their guilt by rejecting the Son of God and the victory he obtained over death and the grave. This is really the defining moment of their rejection and their plan to pay off the soldiers who were guarding the tomb to propagate a lie reveals the depth of the rebellion against God and His anointed Son. In verse 12, we read that after receiving the report from the guards, the chief priests assembled with the elders to take counsel, and then they gave the soldiers a sufficient sum of money. Now think about that word, sufficient. How much money is sufficient to deny the truth of the resurrection? How much money is sufficient to seal your own judgment beside the chief priest and the elders under the accusing finger of the Ninevites? Do you see the the weight of the question? The chief priests and the elders, they, they flash a briefcase of cash and ask the guards, are you willing to deny what you know of the work of Jesus Christ if it means your own comfort, your own wealth? And isn't that the great travesty in society today? Like the chief priests who love their power and authority. And the Pharisees who love their rules taught by men. People often place more importance on their earthly pursuits than the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and His resurrection from the dead. And so we hear the typical questions being asked. Why should I change my way of living even though it's sinful? Isn't it easier just to deny that Jesus Christ has come? To ignore the real implications of His victory? The enemies of Jesus Christ are doing everything they can. Everything that is humanly possible to deny the truth. The power of the gospel of the resurrection. The tension is in the air. Will their plan succeed and we see the victory of this truth the problem for the Jewish leaders is that even in the lie that the disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep no one can deny that Jesus tomb was empty on Easter morning their own scheming had made such a denial impossible. If you take a moment and look at the lie that they paid the soldiers to spread around. Even, even a child, a young child in the congregation today can see that the that lie doesn't make any sense. As the famous pastor centuries ago, Chrysostom, named the golden mouth, so aptly stated, because of the clearness of the truth, they are not even able to make up A falsehood. Who would believe that the disciples who timidly had fled from the side of their teacher would now have the courage to come back to this tomb with the guards there and steal the body? And if for some reason they would return, wouldn't the soldiers sleeping in front of the tomb prevent them from rolling the stone back or at least hear them attempting to do so? And besides all this, Since soldiers who slept on duty were punished with death, why would guards who were at the scene of the robbery 
trumpet the fact that they were sleeping on the job even if their governor would be appeased by the Pharisees. But all these improbabilities that are evident in this lie are overshadowed by the impossibility of the whole story. For the whole fabrication is a contradiction. The truth cannot be suppressed. For if the guards were sleeping, they could not know that the body was stolen at all. Much less that it was stolen specifically by the disciples. It is clear to see that the empty striving of men who fear and reject the implications of the truth, it casts them into all kinds of madness. It's like we sang in Psalm 2. The Lord who sits enthroned in heaven on high, He laughs them to scorn. He has them in derision. Even their lie serves to confirm the truth of the resurrection. There might be one or two, there might be two or more explanations, but there is one powerful, undeniable truth. On Easter morning, the Son of God, who took on human flesh to be crucified on the cross and who was laid in the new tomb, he was no longer in the place that they had laid him. Ironically, the last fraud is not the disciples spreading a lie as the Jewish leaders feared, but the lie denying the resurrection that Matthew tells us is widely circulated even to today. We can add that the lie continues to be circulated today. It continues to deceive people who despise their Redeemer or who are so focused on themselves or so distracted by the temporary things of this life that they are unable to see the only hope of salvation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12, in, in, the, in that, those verses the Holy Spirit explains that, the, that Satan uses, and I'm reading here, wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so we show what explanation we believe by how we live our lives. Do we live as children of the risen Lord who has already defeated death and Satan? Or have we been convinced by a sufficient sum that it's easier to deny the truth and its implications? The warning cry of Psalm 2 continues to echo out into the world. Take heed, O rulers of the earth, and hear. Be wise, O kings, and let his edict warn you. Rejoice with trembling. Serve the Lord now with fear. Kiss the Son, lest he in fury scorn you, lest in his wrath the Lord cause you to perish. It's only by God's grace that we may hold the truth in our hands and that we may know better. For not only do we believe the truth, of the empty tomb that even the soldiers couldn't hide from us. But we also know that our Lord Jesus appeared to our brothers and sisters in the flesh. And He sent them out in the Great Commission so that the good news of Christ's victory could also fill our ears. There was another message. There is another message going out into the world. And that message has lasted for centuries, even to today. Christ's empty tomb is not something that can remain an abstract or interesting fact of the past. 
It's a glorious truth. And we must realize that if we confess that Christ's tomb was empty, we can also confess that we who believe are a people who have crossed over from death to life, from despair to hope, from darkness to light. The facts of the resurrection compel all those in whom God has worked saving faith to submit themselves to the Lord of life, to repent from the rejection of his victory, to rejoice in our new life. The Apostle Peter summarizes our attitude in the beginning of his letter, 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the Lord, the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to His great mercy, He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. We are expecting that revelation even now. The gospel of Christ's empty tomb is a truth that cannot be suppressed. May God grant us the understanding to realize the implications of our confession. The faith to believe that he has risen. And the comfort that comes from this faith as we experience his victory over death in our own resurrection to new life. Amen. We'll sing praises of his victory over death in the grave with the hymn, hymn 33. And we'll sing hymn 33 standing if you're able to stand. Join in prayer. Faithful God and Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before your throne of grace. And we thank and praise you, O Lord, for the revelation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 
We thank you that we may celebrate in his victory and understand also how his resurrection changes our lives, changes the way we, we see this world, our worldview. His resurrection changes the priorities in our lives so that we are always led to our knees to worship you. We thank you that Christ's resurrection gives us comfort in times of sickness, also when we are mourning the passing away of loved ones, when we face things, dangers. Thank you, O Lord, that you have given us reason not to be afraid, but you have given us hope instead of despair. We pray, Father, that you will be with us as a congregation as we seek to love and serve you, love and serve one another. We pray that you will especially comfort and encourage those who are struggling with mental disorders, with sickness, with injury. We pray for our brother Mark Van Delden that you will continue to bless him in his treatment process now too as there was a change from a chemo to radiation. We pray that you will bless him through this as well. All the consequences that it brings, we ask that you will grant him a peace and assurance in your promises. He may experience your nearness in the midst of this ongoing struggle for his health and well-being. We pray for his parents and siblings and friends and all of us as we also Think about Mark often and pray for him regularly. We ask, Lord, that we might find comfort knowing that you are the great physician, especially the physician who heals our souls and gives us peace. We ask, O Lord, that you will also continue to Turn our eyes to you and lift, help us to lift up our eyes to Christ who is seated on his throne. In times of rejoicing and celebration. You give us so many reasons to rejoice each and every day. So many blessings you pour out upon us. We praise you, O Lord, for your goodness to us in these ways as well. Thank you that we're able to celebrate your faithfulness to us in the celebration of birthdays and anniversaries. And we thank you that Curtis and Kara Meyer could be united in marriage yesterday. And we ask that you will bless them as husband and wife to glorify your name as members, citizens of your kingdom, as members of this congregation as well. We ask, Lord, that you will bless the deacons in their work, that you will bless the ministry of mercy, that the deacons may have what they need to carry out their task, to reflect the light of life in their task as well, not only in our congregation, but also in other, in other ways and other manners that people are bringing aid and relief to those in distress we pray for the elders in their task and calling. We pray that you will grant them uh, much wisdom and pastoral, loving, shepherd hearts in their task. That you will also sustain them as they uh, carry the burden of authority and responsibility. Lord, we pray that you will grant them uh, energy and focus as well as they, they need it in their task. And we pray that you will bless the process of nominating and electing and ordaining new office bearers, new elders and deacons. And we pray that you will bless the council meeting tomorrow evening as this is also, this process is also uh, continuing at that meeting. We ask, O oh Lord, that as we go from here, we may go with the, the joy and the conviction and the certainty that we truly are your beloved children in Jesus Christ. That you are leading us in our lives by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
You now have an opportunity to give your Thanksgiving offering to the Lord, and after that we will uh, sing together, standing if you're able to stand, uh, hymn 34, the praising God for giving us this day of days on which we sing our songs of praise.
receive the blessing of the Lord and go in peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.